So this lesson is going to take place in the third dimension. And by this, I don't mean some corny 3D Hollywood movie that you have to put your 3D glasses on. We're talking here about collective rights. Now, what might collective rights be? You can get a pretty good clue by just looking at the name, collective. If you think about it, collective means groups. Or maybe it means something like community. So different than the rights that we've talked about so far, these rights are not necessarily made for individuals, but they're thought about more for groups and communities. So it doesn't mean that the individual is completely locked out of these collective rights or that they're not important. They're actually very important. But that these rights are thought of more about being about groups. These rights are also, and we always talk about this early in the lesson, these rights are often, in many cases, both positive and negative. So we're actually going to kind of just leave that at that and explain what the rights themselves are. And then I'll let you decide which ones are positive and which ones are negative. So what does all of this mean? What, what, what are these collective rights? Well, if you take a look at them, I think it's kind of easy to divide them into these three groups. There, there might be other groups that you might add, but I would say that you want to kind of think of them as being about the environment, being about development, and being about peace. Essentially, we all have a right to a good environment or a healthy environment. We all have the right to development, moving forward in the way that we see fit. And we all have a right to peace or a peaceful life. And there are rights in between these that we'll talk about here in a second. But that's just that gives you an idea of some of the basic, basic ideas. Really important to talk about here is that these things are quite debated. These are not necessarily fixed yet. Because if you look at something like peace, for example, you have to ask the question, who is our agent? Who's going to do this for us? And if you remember, I'm sure you remember this from the last lesson, this is a very important question in the second dimension as well. Because of this and because of lots of other things, this is often called soft law. These collective rights are seen as something that is aspirational, very much like the second dimension as well. These are sort of the front cutting edge of rights. We're still thinking about what they mean and how do we implement them and who does them and how does all of this work. Because of this and related to the fact that we still haven't figured out an agent for some of these things and we still haven't made them law yet, you can kind of look at them in the f like sort of a global framework as just being attached to two or three declarations. Now I'm sure you remember what a declaration is, maybe. Well, a declaration is non-binding. So non-binding actually ties right back to our soft law, which means declarations can't be enforced by law. So they're just recommendations, they're ideas, they're things that we've sort of, as a society, agreed upon. When I think about these rights, and I think if you look at maybe if you look at these, you might agree with you, me, you, you might disagree with me, but if you look at these, I would say collective rights are about the future. Collective rights are about creating the planet and the societies and all the different little components of daily life that we want to have our grandchildren and their great grandchildren to have. So if you look at it, we're thinking about, okay, environment, we want that to be good for the future. We want it good for now as well, but especially for the future. Development and peace are much the same. If we look at these individually, we can also see a lot of space in between them as well. So there's things like the right, between the right to a good environment and the right to development, there's also a right to resources. That is talked about it a lot. And this right to resources obviously has to do with your development, so you can develop better if you have resources, and you can do that in sort of in relation to the environment. 
And maybe between development and peace, there's there's one that you might list and that you see a lot, which is a right to self-determination. We mentioned this in the second dimension, but in the third dimension, we're really referring to groups more than individuals. So self-determination of groups, being able to say, this is our identity, this is who we are, this is what we want to do. It's a certain type of collective freedom in a way. It's a, it's a sort of an idea of creating identity. Now on this slide, I wanted to introduce you a little bit to the interconnectedness of the, the way that different human rights rely upon each other from the different dimensions. So here we've got our first dimension, second dimension, third dimension. And if we remember where our first dimension rights are, what are those? Well, things like opinion and expression. So your right to an opinion and your right to express that opinion. Things like your right to assembly and maybe your right to participation in processes. So things like voting, for example, would be maybe a right that would be included there. On the second dimension level, we're thinking about things like health, thinking about standard of living, so right to an adequate standard of living. And we also have things like education. And down at the bottom, we have our third dimension rights, which we just talked about, so you should have them fresh in your mind. Environment, development, and peace. You'll have to excuse my handwriting here. And to display how these things are interrelated and interconnected and, and, and very important to each other, I think it's a good to think of them, think of them through an example. And we found a great example in our research, one who we had actually never heard of, but who is in this community and in the people who think about these collective rights, someone who's often cited. His name is Ken Sorowiwa, or Wiwa, and he is a Nigerian who died in 1985, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But Ken's story is very interesting. Ken was born in the Niger Delta, where the river meets the Atlantic, and it's a very big oil-producing area. And in his lifetime, oil companies came in and really changed the environment there, and not necessarily in a good way. It's one of the places where uh, sort of pollution is the worst on the planet. Now, this fundamental pollution, this very fundamental changing of the environment of the place where him and his family and his people, the Ogoni people, came from, this environmental change obviously would have an effect on their development because when the environment is in rough shape, well, development is going to be hard as well. This also has a pretty destabilizing effect, this entire situation had a pretty destabilizing effect on peace in the region. So there's a lot of there's lots of strife and conflict in, in the area. And so this third dimension was an area where obviously there were problems at the other dimensions, but this third dimension was particularly being being um, violated, I guess you could say, not just by the company, but even by members of the government, or at least in the opinion of Ken Sarawiwa. So he decided in 1991 that he was going to do something about it. So he stepped up and started becoming an activist. He stepped out, started expressing his opinion on this stuff. Um, and not just his opinion, but also his research, things that he had learned. He was bringing people together from uh, his people. They were assembling, and they were working to try to participate in changing it. Well, obviously this was not well taken. Um, and while they're talking about all of this, while they're up here doing all these first dimension, sort of expressing and, and acting on their first dimension rights, they're talking about things like their health and how the environment is having an effect on their health and how development, slow development, is having an effect on education and on peace and how development is having an effect on their standard of living and how the environment 
and their health are having an effect on their standard of living. So how interconnected all of this stuff is. It's really, really, really interesting, and it's really important. So they're talking about all, about all of these different violations at all these different levels, and people in the government and in the company that they are protesting against are not happy. And there's pretty good documentation from lots of human rights groups and from different activists and people involved in the situation, and even from the government itself, that um, that his rights were being violated, especially his first dimension rights, because those are the easiest ones. Those are the ones where it's very obvious that Nigeria is responsible for these first dimension rights. Now, Ken's story comes to a really tragic end because Ken's movement was a nonviolent one. It was one based upon poetry and assembly and, and, and quiet protest, really, um, much in the sort of spirit of the civil rights in the United States or in other movements across the world, in India and other places. And the Nigerian government was not having any of it. And at some point when some opposition leaders to, this, to Ken's movement turned up dead, him and some of the other members of his peaceful movement were arrested and said, and were accused of murder. Um, the grounds were pretty shaky, and the case went through anyways after a trial. And it was decided that Ken and these other opposition leaders were to be executed. And it went on for a while, the whole debate about whether it was going to happen, and then it did happen. So in 1995, um, and I spelled it wrong, executed, um, Ken and the other opposition leaders in his movement were all executed by hanging. And this in and of itself is a big question in human rights, um, one that's largely been decided. Most companies or most countries have really decided that execution is not right, um, that the right to life is something that is valuable and important. And so Ken's story is really one of his rights being violated in so many different ways um, and in very interconnected ways. And I think it also displays how interconnected these things really are. And uh, get ready for our next lessons, which are all going to be about the intersection of human rights and daily life. <laughs>